here at Spotswood, there's two portraits of him, but they're virtually identical. Um, this tells a lot about his bearing. Uh, there's some kind of fanciful castle in the background, and he was a designer and a mathematician and a logician, um, a quartermaster. Uh, he actually was a general late in his life. He was a colonel. He was a you know, quartermaster. So a lot is evident in this picture. Um, one of the things that I immediately saw without prompting is the, the diminution of the left arm. And I'm about to tell you in a minute here that he actually had a cannonball graze off the sternum, a spent cannonball, meaning it wasn't full force, in 1703 in the Battle of Blenheim that didn't kill him. Not only that, well, this is legend. I mean, he definitely got hit by cannonball, but whether or not his friends were able to retrieve it and he carried it with him the rest of his life, or so he claimed. But I'm going to be telling you that in a second. So, one of the, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the big biography of Spotswood the way I did two years ago for various reasons, but a dominant feature was his military background. He was the son of a surgeon. He rose to the rank of, of colonel as quartermaster. And in the Battle of Blenheim, a spent cannonball raised off his chest. So my point about the picture is that I've understood <coughs> the record being that his left arm never really worked after that. And that, therefore, all the activity he did, especially his incredible horseback riding, was all the more remarkable because he never really had a left arm. And I'm noticing in that painting, you don't really see that left arm either. And I'm just wondering if that's not an artistic way of speaking to that. OK, and now. The legend, not, I, I don't mean to call it a legend, but I have read that this cannonball is somewhere in the governor's mansion in Williamsburg. And I don't, I. Here, it was here, it was not in Williamsburg. I, I've never heard it referred to in Williamsburg. Okay, it's here. okay, so I keep hoping that that cannonball is going to surface, but I don't know. All right, now, here's the thing to know about Spotswood. And we're not at a German or reunion of Spotswood descendants. Is anyone in Spotswood descendant in this room? We are, too. Okay. Well, my gosh. You talk to me afterwards and tell me if I overdid this case. I'm very serious. Because I'm a sensitive person. I don't want to offend anyone, okay? Spotswood is arguably the most celebrated and accomplished of Virginia's colonial governors. However, he was an opportunist, and there are reasons for that. He stirred up controversy, rubbed many people the wrong way, and ended up with lots of enemies. He even started. Okay. So some of his accomplishments, once again, this is sort of reversed, so I can put them all up there. Okay. There's one more. Okay. So he, he actually is a tremendous governor. He's in office for only 12 years. A tremendous, just an amazingly versatile, accomplished man. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Spotswood. He was amazing with Indians, and just to oversimplify, both these forts, including Fort Germana, he originally had Indians in mind, he made trade in mind, he even tried to staff them with Indians. There's a record that he managed to staff Fort Christiana with Indians briefly. So he, he was very enlightened. He tried to uh, bring teachers, he did bring teachers to Fort Christiana. He did bring Indians to uh, um, um, college, William and Mary. Um, he, so he had a very enlightened policy toward Indians. And, in fact, just at the end of his governorship, he had negotiated a treaty on behalf of all the colonies to, to create peace with the Indians. So his Indian policies were um, very enlightened, and he did have Saponi Indians working in his iron works in the 1720s. By the way, he did increase the revenue for the crown, which is his first and most important job as governor, and he does accomplish that very well, uh, and I don't think any other governor did that. Uh, he does complete the governor's palace, or mansion, um, and uh, he does that remarkably well with a lot of what we think are his own designs and ideas. So he's an amateur architect, um, which is not deniable. Um, he did build the entire magazine to house the gunpowder and the troops and the weapons that's in Williamsburg entirely by himself, and he did help complete the burden Parish Church and did amazing work in there too. All right, I I want to tell you about Baron de Graffenried, but 
the reason I want to say it is that we have a sketch from his captivity, but he actually saved this man from slaughter by the, those rough Tuscarora Indians who um, uprose and slaughtered about 300 settlers in the New Bern, North Carolina area, which was a proprietorship at the time. And these, the, this colony was mainly Anabaptists who were more pacifistic, and I wonder if that has something to do with it, mm -hmm. that they weren't maybe well armed or anything, but they were virtually all slaughtered. And um, Graf and Reed was kind of held ransom, and Spotswood immediately came to his rescue and was able to successfully <coughs> revenge the slaughter by hiring other Indians <coughs> to get down there and um, ransom Graf and Reed. Okay, and also he manages to have the pirate Blackbeard killed, which is a fascinating saga in itself. He basically finally gets a shallow boat that can go up after, up over Crow Creek and whatnot, after Blackbeard, who normally can withdraw up the rivers and not have any pursuit. And Lieutenant Maynard actually manages man to man, you know, ship to ship to attack Blackbeard and kill him and cut his head off and put it on the bowsprit of the boat. And that took a lot of gumption. And all during this time, the French and British are having, you know, probably a hundred years of, of colonial conflict. And so the French are always uh, worried. There's always a French invasion is always worried about. Okay, but Spotswood really was impoverished, despite this nice um, duty or this nice assignment of being lieutenant governor. Lieutenant, I love to talk about words, means placeholder, lieutenant, so placeholder. He was the placeholder governor. He was the one who came to the site and took care of business. He shared his 600 pound annual salary with the real governor, Lord Orkney, a fellow Scott. I haven't mentioned Scott connection that um, Spotswood was Scottish, from the Scottish lineage, and basically um, benefited kind of from Scottish patronage in the form of the actual governor, Lord Orkney, um, wanting him to be the one to go to the New World and actually hold down the job there. Now, um, John Blankenbaker has done excellent presentations on Spotswood, and um, so the key is that Spotswood's always looking for an angle to make money with. And the first idea is that there's silver around here. And there really isn't, but everyone thought there was for various reasons. But he doesn't find any. He tries this Indian trading. And ultimately, he's successful with it. But the Board of Trade in London says no to it, fearing that maybe Spotswood's going to benefit too much from it. And they're the ones who should benefit from it, I'm not sure. But uh, so that gets turned down and that ends it virtually in its tracks. Although correspondence takes about three months to get back and forth, remember that. Um, and then what he is successful in, in a complicated series of maneuvers that I don't really understand, he eventually, I don't think, without paying a cent, excuse me, I'm not sure of that, he gets 80,000 acres. So that, I, I, I think that would be fun. John Blankenbaker is the one to do it, but it'd be nice to watch how he acquires all this land. I know most of that's known, but um, I don't know how much he ever really spent on it. And the big thing he does do that is money making, at least for about 10 years, is iron making. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. All right. So he does represent this foreign overlord, <coughs> OK? And he does, he is given a mandate to raise the revenue. And he goes back to this King Charles II edict of about 1685 that is serious about extracting quit rents out of people for their land that hasn't been being done. Okay? But specifically, these three men, all big uh, patrician planters in Virginia, all careful entrepreneurs of various kinds, have it in for him after an initial kind of honeymoon because they kind of exclude him from their inner circle, and they have different interests. And um, when Spotswood kind of stands up to them and wants to um, get them to give more money for their enterprises to the crown than they're willing to, essentially, bad blood occurs. And it's, it's a lot more complicated than I'm making it sound. OK, but once again, I'm 
investigating the idea that he gets about 80,000 acres. He does, by the way, have many homes, three or four, that are all plantations. He does have very successful ironworks. I want ironworks is such a big thing that he accomplishes, it's worth a whole presentation into itself. Basically, he's the first successful ironwork mogul of the New World, that is to say, successfully exporting pig iron to England. It's very important to realize that. And by the way, it takes thousands, thousands of <laughs> acres of trees. Thousands of acres are cut down to feed these furnaces. Thousands, thousands, like 10,000 are cut to feed these mills, uh, these um, uh, smelters. And um, because of that, it's well known that the second and third growth from that clearing is what caused the wilderness that in Civil War times the armies encountered to be thick because it was really third and fourth mm -hmm. generation growth. One spot would clear those 10,000 acres. But, um, but it, it's also very entrepreneurial. Um, he does make manufactured goods that we'll see few things. There's one theory I've heard recently that I haven't talked to my mentors about, but that he could have even made iron uh, cannons in his um, air furnace and massaponics. Uh, an expert on this subject talked to me about it over the phone. And the idea is that an air furnace basically allows you to make more iron at once. And the only reason you go to the trouble of making an air furnace was to create a big artifact like a cannon. So that's, that's a, an idea that this gentleman is talking to me about, trying to get support for. So that's very interesting to think about, because that's not been thought of before. Now, so he's part sage and part scoundrel. 1724 after he commits the police. OK. All right, now, don't forget, too, that it's, and we're glad this happened, because we learned a lot more about his doings because of this, because there's a lot more records about this. But, there were 15 charges, mainly about all that land stuff, I was trying to say. That all, practically all the charges are about <coughs> getting all this land and not quite paying the crown, the very thing he was trying to enforce for everyone else, the money. So, uh, and, and the study of those would help us realize, A, how he did it, and B, um, you know, the kind of manipulations that were required. Um, but it is important to point out that he was exonerated on all charges. So either he was a good amateur lawyer, or he did cover himself, and maybe he wasn't that um, guilty after all. Uh, William Byrd II lobbied for about eight years in London at the King's Ear, saying that Guy Spotswood's got to go, and I should be the new governor. Let me say it again. That Guy Spotswood should go, and I should be the new governor. He did that for about eight years, and finally he was successful, but he was not the new governor. But that's an interesting point. Okay, but he's back for four years in England. And first he acquits himself, that probably takes two years. Then he gets married and um, he begins to have, uh, I think, actually two of his eventual four children in London. But he decides to go back, and that's a very neat, speaks a lot to his character. He was the first to do that. And it showed that he really did lay the foundation for success in Virginia, which he had tremendous success. All right, now, we've got to do this because how many of you know, how many of you associate the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe with Spotswood? Raise your hand. All right? Well, it used to be all anyone knew about Spotswood because the Virginian textbooks that some of you native Virginians grew up reading always celebrated this wonderful thing. And I learned that it's not to be celebrated too strongly at the Germana Foundation. So I do this for them. All right. The idea is what this was a real expedition. It, it was fun. It was six day, 12 days. It was interesting. They, they accomplished a lot, all that. But it wasn't this grand thing that this, you know, Carruthers novel makes it out to be. And it was essentially a real estate land survey kind of thing. It wasn't quite the grand historic occasion um, that everyone that, that everyone retains in their mind. And okay, so it's the original it's largely a real estate survey. Okay. 
they were really having a look at the land with their own interests in mind. And most of the, the I think it's only about 10, but apparently about 40 people went. I think only about 10 of them were actually the gentlemen doing the land surveying, but I'm not really sure. I, I know uh, there are about 10 names. Okay, and most of them ended up with some of the land they were, in fact, riding through. Okay, so specifically, the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe is a name that comes from this 1845 pre-Civil War novel that really uh, legend made it all a legend. Now, the root of the legend is that he gave everyone a small <coughs> golden horseshoe studded with gemstones. He never said he did. I don't think any of the people who ever went on the expedition said that he did. So we're not sure quite where that starts. But the idea was that since none of them exist, there's an effort to say that one exists, but it's really a poor imitation for various reasons. Um, we don't really know, if, we don't think he really did that, okay? All right, now there's also a question about where they really, they, they ended up just in Elkton, in the Shenandoah Valley, looking at the South Fork of the Shenandoah River and calling it the Euphrates and drinking every night and shooting bears and shooting deer and falling off their horses and Maybe he, you know, claimed, claimed some mountains for the King George and all that. But the idea was that Tom and others think that he really just went up through Big Meadow, which would be a shorter route than this markers. And counties in Virginia claim that this has got to be true for their tourism base. So it's a hard one to fight. They have now changed that uh, marker up there. Oh, oh good. Came from this um, Pakistan <coughs> Bible associating iron. But um, the idea was that he was very successful with iron. Okay, this fire back, very important to know about. It's now in Richmond at the Virginia Historical Society. It was found at the U, and it was a major find. Uh, through a complicated set of circumstances, they owed the developer any major things they found. They were able to get the Fortune Historical Society bought it from the internet at inflated cost. But what is amazing about that, this is beautiful and this is incredibly well done iron. So this is an example of probably his air furnace work that might have produced these cannons as well. But we, we have ability to create finished products with his furnaces as well. So that's a wonderful piece. It's down in Richmond. Um, it's a great find. Okay, now at the visitor center, we have these two, well this is one bar, but this was actually in John Crypt, it was across the front door, I think structurally to hold it up and also to, as a description. But this is an angel motif, and I think angel motifs signify a Spotswood product. And there's the date that um, John Spotswood died. Okay? And by the way, John Spotswood is reinterred at behind the visitor center in that black granite obelisk under the recently maybe four, four years ago. And um, I, I really encourage you to visit the center and the memorial park.